you are a God of mercy, you are a God of restoration, you are a God of miracles. We come to you in humble adoration even this afternoon to say thank you for everything you have done for us. Father, Lord God, oh God, our Heavenly Father, we are not perfect, but we are a mere work in progress. If there's anything that we have done, anything we are doing that will not glorify you, Father, Lord God, we ask you for mercy in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In shelter of this, we bless your holy name. We give you all the praise. Father, Lord God, even as your word comes forth, oh God, our Heavenly Father, let it bring deliverance. Let it bring miracles. Father, Lord God, let it bring light to every dark situation in our lives. Let it give us a divine revelation that will lead to a divine turnaround in our situation. Daddy, Lord God, oh God, I want to see the wondrous work in your word. Because your word is a jewel of inestimable value. Your word brings healing. Your word brings restoration. Father, Lord God, oh God, I hereby decree that as many that have come here today with one issue or another, they will never live here the same way in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is possible we have walked into an ordinary day. But as we live here today, we we'll become an extraordinary day in our lives. It is possible we have come here our own way. As we live here today, Daddy, we will live in your own way. Daddy, Lord God, we thank you. We bless your holy name. We adore you. We worship you. Because you are a faithful God. For in Jesus' name we worship. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Grace Levi's. Let's put our hands together for them. Amen. Please, uh, I know we have a space constraint. I want to appeal to the workers. This is what we have on ushers. Our new guests should stay in the main sanctuary. And if, there's, if we have a space constraint, the workers should go to the overflow. For the workers, please, we need to create room for our people who are worshiping for the first, uh, first time or people who are not regular visitors. So if there's a space constraint, please let workers go to the overflow and let the new guests sit in the main sanctuary. And the good Lord will bless us as we obey in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's put our hands together for the Lord and let's begin to appreciate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Amen. We all know that this is the 10th month of the year. This is October 2018. 10th month of the year. You know, my sister, when she, before she started the worship, she said today is also the seventh day of the 10th month. And seven stands for perfection. Is that not so? Five stands for grace. So five plus five is equal to ten. So what we have, we have, the Lord has spoken to us and said, this is the month of double grace. Hallelujah. So and adding seven to eight, we say this is the month of what I call perfected grace. So my brother, my sister, I just wanted to rise up on our feet, you know, you know, and take this prayer point. Say, Father. Make everything perfect in my life in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this month of perfection, perfect everything that concerns me. Begin to pray that even as, say, Father, even as your hand is upon me, let no evil hand touch me. Let me fulfill purpose in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even to, as today is the seventh day, oh God, our heavenly Father, perfect everything that, for in Jesus' name we are praying. Jenica, quickly give me Isaiah 26 verse 3. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. It said, Isaiah 26, 2, 6, verse 3. Oh, can, somebody read, can somebody read for us? It said, it said you will keep 26, not, okay, you will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stained on you because it's trust in you. You know, my brother and my sister, one of the things that we must understand is that the promises of God in the scripture also have what I call a premise. When I talk about a premise, there's something that you need to do to activate that promise. If you look at this scripture very clearly, it says the promise is that God will keep us in perfect peace. Is that not so? But God only keeps us in perfect peace if, we'll, if our mind is stayed on him and we trust in him. I know that in this season of double grace, God wants to give somebody rest and peace on every side. Amen. But I want you to lift up your hands to the King of kings and to the Lord of glory. Say, Father, Lord, God, give me the grace to trust in you. Give me the grace for my mind to be completely stayed on you. Begin to take away every spirit of distraction from my life. 
Give me comfort, even in a season of affliction. Daddy, Lord God, we thank you. We bless your holy name. We give you all the praise, oh God, I have our Father. For in Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. Let's have our seats. And today, I want to talk about the Lord has spoken to us and has said clearly, this is a month of double grace. So what I want to talk about today is the power of grace. The power of grace. And the text of my message is taken from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. And some of the scripture, some of us know very well. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Hebrews 4. He said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Can you give me the New Living, uh, Living Translation? We've seen the New King James Version of that scripture. Let's also look at the New Living Translation, the NLT Version of the scripture. It says, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Listen to this. He said, there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. If you look at this scripture... There are three things that are clearly discernible. First of all, we, are, we talked about the throne of grace. And the second thing that this scripture talks about is that we will find mercy in the throne of grace. And the third thing that I talked about is that we will get the grace to help. You know, when we need it most, when we are in the season of affliction. My brother, my sister. The throne of grace simply means an atmosphere of his presence. And in his presence, you know, there is what? Fullness of a uh, joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures there uh, forevermore. Psalm 16, verse 11. The throne of grace is simply an atmosphere of his presence. You know, let's look at Psalm 16, verse 11 very quickly. He said, you will show me the way of life. Granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forevermore. My brother, my sister, I want to tell you, you know, you can only get the joy of the Lord in his presence at the throne of grace, at the throne of mercy. And the pleasures of living with God, you know, can never be received outside of uh, God. The pleasures of living with God, you cannot get outside of God. When we are talking about grace, you know, grace is God's kindness, you know, and favor towards us without what or merit. Some people call it unmerited favor. When we are talking about grace, grace is God's kindness, you know, and favor towards us without what or merit. You know, we can also look at grace, you know, as God's power that works within us, even in our weakness. You see, my brother, my sister. We must understand one thing. In our walk with God, we must avoid what I call the deception of self-sufficiency. The deception of what? Self-sufficiency. Some people say, you know, I have it all. I don't need God anymore. My brother, my sister, I want to tell you, everything you have, God has given to you. And without God, you are nothing. And I want to say this, you know, emphatically, everything that we are looking for is in God's hand. You know, I've met some people who say, I'm a self-made man. There's no one that is a self-made man. A lot of us are immigrants to this country, and I'm sure a lot of us came to this country penniless, but today some of us live in multi-million dollar homes, and you will say it's by your power. I have worked in a homeless shelter, and I have seen professors who were professors at the university live homeless in this country. After worked all their other life, they were born in this country. So, if you have come from another country and God has blessed you and God has given it to you, you must know that everything that you have has come from Him. That's why we are saying this is a motto of what I call double uh, grace, because it's simply God's kindness, you know, and favor towards us. It is not due to what we have. It is not due to our resume. It is not due to our credentials. It is not due to our what I call family connections. But it's just by His. Uh, grace. Am I talking to someone? So, one of the things that, when, when in talking about the power of grace, there's something that we must realize that grace, you know, gives us the courage to stand alone, you know, 
in a perverted, perverted environment. In the season of perversion. And that is the season that we live in right now. It seems like at times you are, you are somewhere, somebody is talking to you, and you are trying to decode whether the person is even a man or a woman. You know, for you to be able to different, for you to be able to stand alone, my brother, my sister, you need the grace of God. You know, we live in, an, in, 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 in a season whereby our children are being taught in school that you, you don't have to stick with the gender uh, of birth. That you can decide if you're a girl, you can decide, say, I'm not a boy. Or if you're a boy, you can say, I'm not a girl. We live in a season whereby, you know, our children are being taught taught in school that it is not wrong for a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman. But if you want to be different in this season, if you want to make an impact in our generation, we need the grace of God. There was one man who was different in his generation and God set him aside. And God has to use him, you know, you know as a kind of, uh, uh, how would I put it now, as a kind of a vehicle to continue humanity. That was Noah. Thank you for that brilliant example you gave today. If you look at Noah, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 6, uh, verses 5 through 9. Genesis 6, 5 through 9. Let's look, look at Genesis 6, 5 through 9. Genesis 6, 5 through 9. He said, Then the Lord saw, that, saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was, was only evil continually. Verse 6. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Verse 7. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and beast of the earth, for I am sorry that I have been there. Verse 8. But do I found grace in the eyes of what? Of the Lord. Verse 9. This is the generation of Noah. Noah was a just man. Look at it. Noah was a just man. Perfect in the generation. Noah walked with God. You see, Noah lived in a season that there was so much perversion. But he made himself different. And what did God do? God honored him. The scripture records that Noah found grace in the sight of God. Because he was somebody who was faithful. He was somebody who was obedient to the commandments of God. And I saw because he was faithful, God gave him the courage to be different from every other one. And God used him as a condom to, to, uh, for the continuation or perpetuity of humanity. My brother, my sister, if we want to find grace in the sight of God, we must learn to live a life that is holy and acceptable unto him. You know, when God approached Abraham, he told Abraham, he said, walk before me and be blameless. You, and even as a pastor, I've often wondered, is it possible for somebody to be blameless? But my brother, my sister, it is not possible through our own human effort. If we want to live a life that is holy and acceptable unto God, my brother, my sister, we all need the grace of uh, God. It is his grace that makes us uh, holy. Because his grace is that power that works, works in us, you know, you know, that makes us perfect in spite of our weaknesses. Am I talking to someone? The next thing again that grace will do is that, you know, God's sustaining grace provides the strength to endure in a tough season. God's sustaining grace will give us the strength to endure when we are passing through trials and tribulations, when we are passing through a troubled season. One thing we must understand is that everyone here at some point in our lives will go through a tough season. And I'm sure in the past, some of us have gone through very tough seasons. But we all must understand that God, in his infinite mercy, has given us that grace to be endured. That's why Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, what does it say? Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, very quickly. Galatians 6 verse 9. It says, it says and let us not go weary while doing good. Say, for in due season we shall, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. My brother, my sister, like I have mentioned before, there are three categories of people. There are some people who are preparing to go to enter into a storm. There are some people, as I'm speaking right now, they are going through what I call a raging storm. 
there are others who have just exited a storm. And every one of us here belongs to one of those categories. But if you are in the midst of a raging battle, you are in the midst of a raging storm, it is the grace of God that will give you that strength to endure. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 through 10. 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, Be sober, be vigilant. It says, Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9 says, Resist him, steadfast on the face, knowing that the same suffering are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Verse 10. Say, but may the God of all grace, who brought us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, he said, after you have suffered a while, say, perfect, establish, strengthen, and set to you. You see, if you look at that scripture very carefully, he said, the Lord of all grace recognizes that there's a period of suffering. But what the scripture is telling us that in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of our troubled time, what will God do? He will what? Perfect us. Eh? He will establish us. He will strengthen us and will uh, settle us. So that's why, you know, uh, the scripture also tells us that we should count it all joy when we fall into what? Diverse uh, temptation. Some other version of the scripture says diverse uh, trial. Like I've always tell you, my brother, my sister, we must choose, deliberately choose joy. Because a heart that is joyful will always attract the mercies and the miracles of God. I know that at times you say it's tough. Pastor does not understand what I'm going through. Pastor does not understand that in the last three months I have struggled to pay my rent. Pastor does not understand that I've been in this country for so long and I've been, you know, sending out resumes. I've not gotten the job that is commensurate with my skill set. Pastor does not understand that, oh, I have this affliction that takes me to the hospital almost on a monthly basis. But what I want to tell you, you know, the, I, I'm the pastor of the church. Thank God for that. But I will be honest with you. I cannot resolve your issue. The best I can do is to pray with you. But that's why we must all look onto the hills from where's coming our help. Because they say, where does my help come from? They say, my help comes from God. So you must understand that your help comes from the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The one who was the one who is and the one who is what yet to come. But that tough season you are going through is for a moment and it's working out for your good. If you look at Romans chapter 8, let's look at Romans chapter 8, 35 through 39 very quickly. Romans 8, 35 through 39. It says, who, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Verse 36. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the Lord of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My brother, my sister, we must understand that the issues that we are going through, they are not bigger than God. With God, all things are all possible. But everything comes to us by his uh, grace. Praise the Lord. Thank God we have grace in the house. Hallelujah. So maybe if you need more grace, just want to touch her. You know what happened? When we went to Cuba, you know, we went with, when we went to Cuba for a missionary trip, we went with faith, we went with patience, and we went with grace. <laughs> so I told the congregation, if you want faith, just go and touch Dickiness' faith. If you want patience, touch Pastor Patience. If you want grace, touch Sister Grace. So before you go out today, whichever one you want, you want, just touch any of them and God will give you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Me, I want the three, so I will start my wife. As, mm. Dickiness. Mm. Sister Grace. Mm. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
Is there any what they call joy in the house? Who is joy? Oh, joy, you are there. Okay. So if you want joy, just. <laughs> all right, God bless you all. You know, but you see, we must there are three, uh, two categories of people I want to minister to today before, before I end the sermon. You know, those who I call, who I, what I call in the ultimate dark place. What do I mean by the ultimate dark place? Those who currently are discouraged, who are depressed. Those who are entertaining what I call suicidal thoughts. You know, you know I say this with a heavy heart. You know, uh, because I don't know, most of you, I watch CNN a lot. There's a guy called Anthony Bourdain. How many people know Anthony Bourdain? I know I used to enjoy th that guy's programs. And then I used to look forward to his program. But one day there was a breaking news that the man had taken his own life. He was somewhere in France, you know, was trying to film one of his um, episodes, and he took his own life. And I began to wonder, what would make a man wake up one day and take his own life? You know, it was not just, it was not, it, the, 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 the issue that he had did not just start that day that he took his own life. But it must have been something that happened over time. He was depressed, he was discouraged, yet he was shooting films that a lot of us were enjoying, but nobody had an understanding you know, of what was troubling him. But I'm saying it's also common, even amongst Christians. A lot of us are here today, we are depressed, we are discouraged, you know, we are even entertained suicidal thoughts. You know, if somebody asked the question one, is it, is it okay for a, a Christian to think of suicide? Well, we have even heard of pastors who have committed suicide. That's what I mean by being in the ultimate dark place. And if you're in the ultimate dark place, my brother, my sister, it's only the grace of God that can take you out of there. And I'll be honest with you, I was once depressed. You know, I was one high society thought. Not now, a long time ago. Because I had come to the country, you know, and I felt that, you know, the job I was doing was not commensurate with my skill and experience. I felt that I had missed my way. I felt that I had left everything I had going well for me in Nigeria to come to Canada to suffer. I was depressed, I was discouraged. But I can tell you, I was, I was a minister in church. I was going to church every Sunday. I never missed church one Sunday. But I will tell you something, it was the grace of God that saved me. And my wife was praying for me because she knew what I was going through. And I think when I was speaking at the moment, there's somebody at that point. You don't have to be ashamed. But what I will tell you is that the grace of God is sufficient to rescue you from that situation that you have found yourself. But one thing is that it is possible you have not put yourself in that situation. But one thing you must understand is that you have a responsibility to take yourself out of that situation. Let's look at Genesis chapter 30 verses 1 and 2. Genesis 30, 1 and 2. He said, now when Rachel saw that she bought Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. She was frustrated. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld you from the fruit of the womb? At some point, Rachel was frustrated. She was depressed. She was discouraged. She looked at her sister Leah and Leah was having children. You understand? She could not have children. What did she do? At some point, she spoke to her husband Jacob. If you don't give children, I will die. She entertained suicidal uh, thoughts. But if you look at, let's look at Genesis again, chapter 30, verses 22 through 24. 22 through 24, Genesis 30. It said, then God remembered Rachel. He said, and God listened to her, and God opened her womb. Verse 23. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. Verse 24. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. You know, if you look at the scripture, it's so profound. Profound on the sense that at some point she was suicidal. Am I correct? But when God remembered her, you know, what did she say? She became pregnant and she confessed that God took away the reproach. As I'm speaking at the moment, God wants to remember someone and take away this report of depression, this report of discouragement. This report of suicidal thought that is tormenting you. But I will tell you something. You can only get it by the grace of uh, God. That's why the scripture says, when it says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. What the Lord is saying, not with fear or timidity. Let us come boldly you know, to the atmosphere of his presence and get the deliverance that we need. And get help 
that where we need it most. If you are depressed, you are discouraged, you are entertained, you are told, this is the time you need help most. Then the second category of people again I want to minister to are those who are veered away from the lost present and your spiritual foundation, you know, is fractured. Psalm 11 verse 3, what does it say? It says, if the foundation be destroyed, say, what can the righteous do? David had a strong spiritual foundation. God had prophetically declared, say, this is a man after my own heart. But if you look at, is this 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 1? 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 1. Let's quickly look at that. He said, he it happened in the spring of the year. He said, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Jacob and his, sorry, Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. He said, but David remained at war at Jerusalem. When kings were out in the battle, what was he doing at uh, Jerusalem? But we know that state in Jerusalem, what did he do? He did not only lead to adultery, but he led to mother. This was somebody who had a great spiritual foundation. But you know what? At some point, God intervened and God restored him. We must understand that the God that we serve is a God of mercy and it's also a God of uh, restoration. The God that we serve is in the business of restoration. But it, as I'm speaking at the moment, there's somebody you have veered away from the throne of grace, from the throne of mercy. And God is asking you, my son, my daughter, come back. I want to restore you. Come back home. It is not just to be coming to church. It's not about churchianity. It's about a relationship. The general facility of this mission, Pastor Debo, he says one thing. He said, the fact that you're born in a bakery does not make you a loaf of bread. The fact that you're born in a garage does not make you a motor car. So if you do not have a genuine relationship with God, with, G with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this grace that we are talking about is not for you. But I know that, you know, it is possible that this whole service has been organized for you alone. You see, nobody will live here empty-handed. Nobody will live here the same way they have come. God is feeling mercy will touch you in a way as never before. As God touches you, you will be an amazement to your generation. The first category of people I want to talk to, you are depressed. You are and don't be shy. You know, you know we, 